For 2022, Jeep's very popular two-row SUV, the Grand Cherokee, is all new. Well, today we're going to check out all the features and then we're taking it to our test hill. That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. The Jeep Grand Cherokee is one of the most popular SUVs you can buy that offers both comfort and off-road capability. The model we're looking at today is one that I would personally pick. This is the 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk. Like Jeep's other Trailhawk models, this has everything you need to climb a mountain. It comes standard with Jeep's Quadratrack 2 four-wheel drive, the select terrain system, front disconnecting sway bar, underbody protection, air suspension that provides up to 11.3 inches of ground clearance, and all-terrain tires. It also has the trademark Trailhawk red recovery hooks. Very important. Our test vehicle was loaded with a number of extras, including the luxury and advanced groups, panorama sunroof, upgraded infotainment, and a passenger side touchscreen. Prices you see it here, $60,645 US dollars, including destination. It is interesting to note that this color, bright white, is the only color you can get without a surcharge. You want white? You want black? You want black on black? Yeah, you're going to pay an extra $395. Personally, I wouldn't get all these extras. Even a base Trailhawk is nicely equipped for just over $54,000. Now, a quick note about pricing. We did notice that currently on Jeep's website, the pricing is different than the pricing they provided us. So use this pricing only as a guideline. Under the hood is Jeep's 3.6 liter V6. It is good for 293 horsepower and 260 pound-feet of torque. It is connected to an eight-speed automatic transmission and you can only get the Trailhawk trim with four-wheel drive. If you need more power, a V8 is also available. EPA rates this setup at 19 miles to the gallon in the city and 26 on the highway. Towing capacity is now 7,200 pounds. Now let's talk about the tires. The standard tires on this Trailhawk are Goodyear Wrangler Territory ATs. They are mud and snow rated and they are a 265-60 R18 fitment. Now, the lugs on these look pretty wide, so I think they'll be fine in like muddy type situations, although they're clearly not deep mud rated. Also, they do not have a peak designation, meaning that they're not gonna be good for deep snow. But it's spring in the Northwest, so we don't have to worry about that today. In the back, of course, there is a hands-free lift gate. Just wave your foot, and boom, there you go. Behind the second row, there's 37.7 cubic feet of cargo capacity. With the second row folded, you're looking at 70.8 cubic feet overall. And yes, it is enough to sleep in. If I wanna stretch out, I have to be diagonal. If I hunker up a little bit, I can be on the side, which is important, of course, if you have the back full of gear. Under the floor, is a spare tire, but it does not match the tires on the vehicle. So it's kind of useless. You also get a 12 volt DC socket and a power push button to close it. Okay, see how this fits. In the second row, there's a lot to talk about. First, this massive panorama sunroof just lets in so much light. The seats are pretty comfortable. The leather is nice, um, a little on the firm side, but not too bad. Down here, I get three stages of heat on the seats um, on both outboard positions. And then for power, there's lots of options here. I get an AC socket because there is a built-in inverter. I also get USB-C and USB-A's as well as my own vents. I get a privacy screen. What else do I get? Oh, yeah, fold-down armrest with integrated cup holders. And I can even tilt the seat back if I want to be more comfortable. Yeah. This is cool, I like this. I know my kids would definitely like this. Oh yeah, this is familiar. It looks just like all the newly updated Jeeps. Uh, the Compass has this new interior, uh, the Wagoneer has the interior, and now the Grand Cherokee. Now, of course, the Grand Cherokee L actually premiered this new chassis and interior. That is only available as a three row. This is the first time this has been available as a two row. And Personally, the two row is more interesting to me. Maybe this to you too. Maybe that's why you're watching. Let's power it up. 
Now I see we have a digital gauge cluster that is now standard on the Trailhawk version of the Grand Cherokee. And uh, I like this interior. I think it looks great. However, so much gloss black and this vehicle has 3,927 miles on it and it's already scratched to kingdom come. Uh, little tiny micro scratches that are only gonna get worse as this vehicle ages. It's just not a good look. It looks fantastic at the dealership, but as soon as you roll it off, yeah, not so good. Now this vehicle comes with an option that you just don't see very often. Granted, Mercedes offers it and Jeep offers it on some of their higher end trims, but this is the first time you can actually get a Grand Cherokee with a passenger side screen. So let's check that out before we get into all of this. One of the more important things to understand is that this screen can pretty much only be viewed by the person sitting right here. When you're sitting in the driver's seat, it's polarized to the way that basically it's all black. Likewise, even if you're just a little bit to the right, it gets dark very quickly. Um, up, down, perfectly easy to view. So we're gonna take a look at what we have here. There's not a lot, to be honest. Uh, we can control audio, we can control video input from the USB, and we can also control HDMI. There is an HDMI input if you wanna watch movies up here. Although, that said, let's look at this. So if I'm sitting here in a comfortable position, that display is there. This is an iPhone 11. To make the iPhone 11 the same effective size for viewing, I have to hold it here. Realistically, you're gonna hold the phone up here, which is a larger perceived screen size than this thing over here. So you can't just look at the screen size and go, oh, that's bigger than my phone, because as it gets further away, obviously it gets smaller. So I'm not sure this is the best way to enjoy entertainment. It's kind of cool as a concept in execution, just like with the Mercedes ELS that also has a passenger side screen. I just don't really see the point. So it's kind of fun, but is it really necessary? I really feel you should spend the money elsewhere, like buying a full-size spare that matches the other four tires. That is gonna be way more important in day-to-day -day living than that screen is. But I guess if you have everything else, add that on, knock yourself out. Just doesn't really fit my use case scenario. Now the seat here is pretty comfortable. I get lots of power adjustments. I can also save to memory positions. And it's not only heated, it also has ventilation. Clicking up here, um, I can also turn on the steering wheel heat as well. One thing I do like about this is that Jeep didn't go crazy with their touchscreen. They didn't put everything into the touchscreen. I still have complete control over my air con down here. I have my seat and uh, steering wheel, heat and cooling down here. And then up here, I have some of the more car specific stuff. I have the auto start stop, lane detection, traction control, parking sonars, which are important. There's also a physical push button up here to turn that passenger screen on and off. Of course, I also get a physical volume and tuner knob as well. So this touchscreen system, we bought earlier this year a Jeep Compass that basically looks the same, just smaller. And the system, I actually really like it. It just was a little bit on the buggy side. Every once in a while, I would need to reboot the system. Now, the nice thing, unlike GM's vehicles, this one, if it does have an issue, you can reboot it. You just hold down the power button for about 10 seconds and it'll reboot. You can do that also while it's driving. Now, since I've had this vehicle for filming, I have not had to reboot it yet. So um, I've found that Apple CarPlay, which is wireless on this, has worked just fine. He says, um, with it not actually connected, huh, okay. It's not even showing up in Device Manager anymore. It was set up on this. I'll go ahead and add the device again so you can see the process. Essentially, you search for your Bluetooth device. You find the Bluetooth device in your settings up here. There it is, you connect, a pair, yes. Do Apple CarPlay, yes please. Follow instructions on your device. So now I can just hit this button and boom, there we go. And it works pretty well. I find the screen looks great, nice colors. Uh, even though it's glossy, that doesn't actually bug me up here quite so much. It's actually really easy to clean with a nice, you know, slightly damp cloth. Um, no problems with it here. It's also very responsive, even when it's running without wires. Uh, now, as far as charging your device while you're running hands-free, this does have a wireless charging pad right down here. 
um, or you can also use USB-C or USB-A if you like. Uh, the HDMI for the passenger screen is also down here as well. So, you know, they just give you tons and tons of options. I love the fact that they have two USB-C and two USB-A. It really gives a lot of flexibility. And I can just close that up. Don't need to look at that anymore because, of course, I have full access to my phone up here. Now, as far as the built-in stuff, it's actually a pretty good setup. We have media, which, you know, um, covers Sirius XM satellite, terrestrial radio, all that kind of stuff. We can also duplicate a lot of the climate controls up here uh, with the comfort setting where we can hit do fan levels, temperature, what sections, you know, what, what area the cooling is going to, all that kind of stuff, pretty straightforward. And then we, have, of course, have CarPlay and then Vehicle. And this is where it starts to get complicated uh, because we have the off-road pages. Those are unique to the off-road capable versions of the Grand Cherokee. So launching the off-road pages gives me a nice visual, easy to understand look at what is going on because there is a lot that can go on in this system. It's a very complicated four-wheel drive system. It's Jeep's Quadra Track 2 setup, which isn't quite as cool as the Quadra Drive system. And hopefully I got that right because Jeep does not include a lot of information about this vehicle online, so hopefully I got that right. The important thing to understand here, though, is that it has a disconnectable front sway bar for better articulation. It has a lockable rear differential, and it has a proper differential in the middle that can also be locked. You don't have to understand what any of that means. You can just use the select terrain system down here to tell the vehicle what kind of surface you're on, and it will adapt everything from the suspension um, not just the damping, but also the ride height, locking, unlocking that rear diff, the transfer case, the sway bar, um, as well as using individual wheel braking, which gives just another layer of capability. It's really a very, very cool system, and it does have a low range. I still don't like having just a push button, but that's just me. I'm, maybe it's you too, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a little weird. And then if you are traveling off grid, it is important to know that this does include breadcrumbing capability. Uh, once you do that, it'll actually drop little pips along the map so you can find your way out of um, places that are off grid. Now down here, we have one more button, a crawl control feature, which we will check out a little bit. I can even manually adjust the ride height at the highest setting. That's 11.3 inches of ground clearance, which is nuts. That'll get you through almost anything. And it really positions this vehicle, I mean, combined with the rear locking axle and the low range, it really makes this far and above more capable than pretty much anything else on the market. This vehicle is more about luxury comfort, but without sacrificing any capability. And I don't think anybody nails it quite like Jeep does with the Grand Cherokee. The steering wheel is nice. It's standard Jeep issue. It has lovely leather with contrast stitching, push buttons on the left to control the digital gauge cluster. And I actually like this digital gauge cluster. It took a little while to kind of figure out what's going on with it because there's just so much available. You can customize this more than pretty much any system. Now you can't customize the look quite so much as you can what you're looking at. And I think that's actually a little bit more important. And then this one also has kind of a cool feature night vision. With night vision, you can see living creatures before you hit them. It's a very cool system. Um, I don't know if it's worth the money of the package, but you do get a lot of other stuff and it's just part of one of the luxury packages. But it is really cool. And it actually, I don't have video to support it, but uh, I was driving late at night one night and some kid was crossing the road wearing all black. Couldn't see them at all. I, I didn't come close to hitting them at all. Uh, but I saw them on this type of a system before I saw them with my eyes and I could slow down way before I even got close to them. And that was kind of the first time that I looked at the system and said, okay, I, I see the value of that. It's not just a gimmick. In addition to futuristic tech like that, it also has, you know, your more standard safety stuff. And I can go down here to safety and driving assistance. We have automatic emergency braking, active lane management, uh, night vision, video warnings. I can actually set up different warnings. Parking sensors, blind spot warning, which I actually like little triangle. It's not, you know, I prefer it to be inside, but it's, it's visually easy to see. Hill start assist. Of course, we also have surround view camera system with rear cross traffic alerts. There's also tire fill assist, which I can click on this and it says provides alert for tire fill assist. Okay, not the best description, but basically it'll honk when you hit your target PSI. 
We, of course, also have a massive sunroof. That is an option in this vehicle. It does not come standard. And yeah, I mean, just so much stuff here. Although I don't think I would pay for all of these features. It's a bit much. As the Trailhawk trim sits in its base configuration, it's actually pretty nicely equipped, even at around $54,000. And I think it's still, it's a very worthwhile vehicle to look at there, maybe add one package, um, but don't you don't have to go bonkers. One more thing to talk about, we have the selectable eight-speed automatic transmission down here. It is a knob. The knob works pretty good. We have a, uh, we got the beeping because I have a, the back is open, but just bear with me here. Uh, we have directional guidelines. It's a nice camera. You can change your view easily. And it also functions as a trail camera when you are off road. We'll take a look at that a little bit later in the video. This vehicle does have built in navigation. Uh, it works pretty good, actually. I can do a verbal search if I want. Navigate to the nearest Victor's Coffee. There it is. Boom. It's pretty straightforward. Victor's Coffee. Victor's Celtic Coffee Company, 7989 Gilman Street, Redmond. Oof. She said Celtic. It should be Celtic. Anyway, I'll let that slide. And you just hit drive and it takes you out there. So it's a pretty good system. It also gives you gas prices and it's cloud connected. So you get a lot of extra data. So finally done going over all the features and there was a lot of them. Now it's time to hit the trail. On the road here is actually where the Grand Cherokee shines. It is really all about like these road trip adventures. It has a ton of space. It's very comfortable to drive on the freeway and it has very modern features like adaptive cruise control. Let's give that a try. Basically hit set, set my target speed. And then at this point, it'll mirror the vehicle in front of me so long as that vehicle is going below my target speed. Set. Cruise control set for 70 miles per hour, and now I basically just roll along. Now, a lot of new vehicles have really good lane centering, which kind of feels like a semi-autonomous mode. This one does not. It does have lane detection, and it will give you a little bump when it detects that you're hitting the lane, like right now, but at this point, I'm pretty much on my own. So it's not gonna like steer around corners or anything. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, uh, I want to drive my own car. Why would my car, why would I spend so much money on a nice car to let the car drive for me? It's a very valid point. However, if you are doing a multi-state journey, it is really nice sometimes just to have the car do a little bit of an assist uh, so that you don't have to like, you know, do all these micro corrections and it just makes the trip a little bit more pleasant. In this class of vehicle of the family SUV with two rows, there's not a lot of competition. I mean, yeah, you'd think of the Toyota 4Runner, but the 4Runner with the Trick Center Diff, which is the Limited, which has a four-wheel drive all the time setup, and that's the only one that does, with the exception of a couple trims that are related. That one doesn't have the proper approach and departure angles because it actually has more of a city-fied uh, nose and tail. And they just don't make an off-road version of it. So it's really nice that Jeep continues to provide a Trailhawk version of their Grand Cherokee, which gives better approach, better departure, yet also has the great everyday drivability of a vehicle with full-time four-wheel drive. I don't have to know when I'm switching it from you know, rear-wheel drive to all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive or low. I don't need to know any of that stuff. I just need to know that I wanna keep pointing this way and the Grand Cherokee will get me where I'm going. And a lot of people kind of just at least feel safer knowing that it is four wheel drive all the time. So this vehicle being the size that it is and a two row with full time four wheel drive, the list of competition is very short. Uh, even though it seems like there's a lot of competition, something like a Kia Telluride, not really because that's just an all wheel drive system, not a proper four wheel drive system. And we'll explain what that is a little bit more later. Um, this would more compete with something like the Toyota 4Runner Limited uh, because that one has full-time four-wheel drive. Uh, it would also compete with some of the Land uh, Rover offerings. Yeah, the list is pretty short, especially when you're thinking off-road focused four-wheel drive. And uh, so we, of course, are driving this over to our test hill, and we do have a little bit of driving to do. And so far, this has been really comfortable. The seats are nice. I have heating and cooling. The electronics are great. The Wi-Fi CarPlay, when it works, is fantastic. Uh, 
But let's take a dip off the freeway and see how this thing handles on a forest road that is paved. Because we do have other drive mode settings here. Now this does have air suspension and the suspension will both raise and lower the vehicle, it also is uh, adaptive. The dampers are adaptive in that they'll provide a, a different ride depending on your drive mode. So right now we're in auto and it's, it's doing pretty good. It's a little rolly, but it's not too bad. It's comfortable. Um, I like this ride height. It's a very commanding view of the road without being ridiculous. You know, if I switch it into sport, it's gonna lower the vehicle just a little bit. It's gonna tighten up that suspension. Now let's go around the corner and feel what it feels like. It's also gonna optimize the four-wheel drive system. Now, the four-wheel drive system in this vehicle is rear biased by a little bit. It's a couple extra percent of power to the back, and they do that through a trick clutch and differential setup in the middle uh, that is exclusive to the Quadra Track 2 four-wheel drive system, uh, which is a lot different than the Quadra Drive all uh, four-wheel drive system which you find in the top 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 trims of the Grand Cherokee as well as in some of the Wagoneers. Turning radius is pretty good. Now the steering does feel very heavy and that's okay you know this is a biggish four-wheel drive vehicle so you know that's fine. It's kind of what you expect actually. Let's see if we can do a zero to 60. And I'm gonna keep it in sport mode. I'm gonna drop the hammer and see what we can do here. Three, two, one, and go. Up, 40, 50, and 60 in 7.66 seconds. Even though I really like this vehicle, I have to admit, there's a few little buzzes going on here, and I don't know if that's because this is a early build on the brand new chassis, uh, or it's something owners are gonna have to listen out for, but there's an occasional rattle over there. There's definitely a little buzz up here. Um, and then, so I guess if you are an owner or you're considering buying one of these, keep an eye on that and just make sure that that's not something that happens with your vehicle, because vehicles shouldn't buzz and rattle anywhere, especially here in 2022. Uh, most vehicle manufacturers have that down pretty good. So what are the benefits of a full-time four-wheel drive system versus a part-time four-wheel drive system? Well, a part-time system, like what you would get in a 4Runner uh, still today, is a system that is basically two-wheel drive until you shift it into four-wheel drive, at which point it locks the transfer case. Let's uh, turn this around and I'll do a demonstration. So the difference here between full-time four-wheel drive and part-time four-wheel drive comes down to how the system pushes power front to back. A part-time system will be rear-wheel drive most of the time. You shift a lever or turn a dial, it'll lock the transfer case, which locks power front to back 50-50. Now this vehicle has full-time four-wheel drive. What it, that does is it allows you to shift power around front to back as necessary, um, and they do that with a combination clutch and differential. So let me demonstrate. Right now, we're in full-time four-wheel drive. This is just how you would drive it every day. And I can turn, and I'm getting no chatter. It's distributing power front to back as necessary because on this type of a thing, the front wheels actually have a longer distance to travel than the rear wheels, which means that if you had equal power, there would be skipping and chattering. So now let me shift this into four low. I'm gonna put it into neutral, four low. Oh, I'm in sport mode, I can't be in that. Let's go to four low. Okay, now because this is using a drive mode system, it actually switches a bunch of stuff around. It raises the suspension up. Uh, it puts it into four low, which locks the transfer case power front to back. So now when I go drive and I turn, there's gonna be binding in those rear wheels. Now you don't really wanna do this with a vehicle that you own, because it's really kind of, it's, it's hard on the powertrain but you can, there's skipping back there because it's trying to push even power to both front and back sets of wheels. And in doing so, it, you can't traverse different distances. It just doesn't work out. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop punishing this vehicle. I'm gonna put it into neutral. Ooh, yeah, it, it, it acquired a bunch of torque into the system. So 
it just released that when I popped that off. Now that we're in full-time four-wheel drive, now we can just get back on the freeway and head over to our test hill, and we'll see how well the rest of these systems work in challenging conditions. Let's do it. So for our first test, we're gonna do the Rattler. This is a test of crawl ability, ground clearance, and also gives us a chance to kind of experiment with the toys uh, that come on this Grand Cherokee. So first thing we're gonna do, I already did, these ruts are really deep today, and I just know we're gonna need maximum ground clearance. I could just do height control, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna actually switch this into rock mode because we're coming up on some rocks. It tells me to shift into neutral. Oh, I have to first shift into four low. Switching into rock. That automatically will raise the suspension, I think. Yeah, brings us all the way up. So our suspension is raising now. And I can go into drive. And I don't have to wait for it to go all the way up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and drive here and it'll continue raising until it reaches the full 11.3 inches of ground clearance, which is a lot. Now we also have a lot of really cool features here in the screen in that I can pick off-road, go to off-road pages, and this will give me a lot of advanced information about my vehicle. It does take a moment to load though, which is a little annoying. So I can see right now that my rear axle locker is currently unlocked. My front sway bar is currently connected. I have some accessory gauges here. If I wanna look at some additional details, I can look at my pitch and roll, and then my current select terrain mode. And then there's suspension, uh, because of course this has the air suspension, and then a forward facing camera with tracks, which I love, so we're gonna keep it there. Just gonna roll forward. Now there is a button down here, and I believe this is a crawl control feature. Ah, yes. So now I can use the paddles up here to adjust my speed, and it's like an off-road autopilot. We've demonstrated this before, both on the Ford Bronco as well. I'm gonna place my, just, just to the right of that rock. Uh, as well as the Forerunner, uh, the TRD Off-Road and Pro models have it. So I, my foot's not on the gas. The vehicle is just crawling along and I can go as low as 0.6 miles per hour, which is, this is really cool. So this particular road isn't really difficult for a vehicle like this. Um, however, a vehicle like a Kia Telluride uh, or um, pretty much anything that's an all-wheel drive with minimal ground clearance would either bottom out on this or just have a heck of a time shifting power around. This one makes it look easy and that kind of is the point of the Grand Cherokee Trailhawk. It makes stuff like this really easy. I'm not doing anything, just letting it drive itself. I can also switch to my back camera if I want to see what's back there. It really makes off-roading incredibly easy. Now I can of course override at any time. I don't have to hit a button. I can just put my foot on the brakes and it'll stop. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off now because I don't wanna do that anymore. They do call it the select speed control, by the way. Now we have a bit of a climb. I don't think this will be a problem for it. It's a little moist, but it's not like mud, like it's been in the past. When this is mud, this is incredibly difficult. Uh, today, I think we're gonna have no problem. So I'm actually gonna take the inside line here, which is the most difficult. It's gonna be looser. It's also way steeper. And as I climb, I think we're gonna end up taking traction off that front left wheel. Yep. Okay, so right here, I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect my front sway bar. And in doing so, it actually reaches down to get more grip because obviously you actually wanna keep the wheels on the ground if you can. Articulation is key. Okay, now that we got that, that was super easy. Time to try the more challenging road, which we call the Sidewinder. There we have a number of challenges that'll really put this vehicle to the test. So rolling back into the start of the courses, I am now at my maximum ride height, which is 11.3 inches of ground clearance. Uh, I am in rock mode, which I don't really need because the parts that we have coming up, it's more mud and dirt. So let's go ahead and switch that into sand mud mode. Sand mud mode will actually allow for a little wheel spin. And the reason for that is to free mud off the lugs of the tires, which will give them more bite. 
if we're rolling really slowly, the mud just cakes up and they basically become slicks. Uh, so I'm still in four low sand mud mode. It's rolling through. Okay. And now this time, instead of going up for the Rattler, I'm going left for the Sidewinder. If you're looking for a hill descent control, it doesn't have that per se. Instead, it actually has that crawl control feature, select speed control, which we can use downhill as well as uphill. So here I can pick my speeds. Eh, 1.8, this is kind of a nice clip. Now my foot's not on the brake, it's not on the gas, it's using individual wheel braking to keep the vehicle as straight as possible. It's a very easy, well-controlled descent. And this is one thing that Jeep does better than most other companies is that their low range is always really good. I mean, 44 to one on a vehicle like this with these luxuries is just a nice thing to see in a vehicle that costs less than $100,000, mind you. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the select speed control. Now this will scrape noses of vehicles, but because I'm so high right now from the air suspension lift, I'm not gonna worry about it. And I'm just gonna throttle in and up we go. The next thing are the locks. So to set up for this particular section, I am ultimately gonna lock that rear diff, but I'm not gonna do it yet. However, I am gonna disconnect the front sway bar to give me as much articulation as possible. And uh, let's see if we can do this. And of course it's starting to rain. <laughs> so this is gonna get more difficult if we don't get out of here before the rain hits. Oh, now this is actually really important. I wanna turn, turn on my front facing camera. Oh, by the way, I can hit this button and it'll wash the camera, which is neat. So first we have to go over a cross cut and that's really gonna lift traction off. Now you can see what the wheels are doing in sand mud mode with no locked rear diff. That gets us through and turn on the forward facing camera because the line is critical on this next section. And you already saw how it kind of struggled when the rear diff wasn't locked. So let's go ahead and lock that rear diff. I don't remember where the button is. Uh, let's take a look and see if it's an auto locker. Uh, so I'm going to go back to front facing camera. I wish this system worked faster though. It's very slow. So the critical thing here is to place my wheel up on a rock here on the left, which gives me the best grip on the left. Now on the right, it's just mud, so there's really not much of a grip going on there. And I really have to be careful about shimmying into the, the hillside on my right. I'm just gonna slowly crawl. Wow, that just makes it look so easy. Okay, now we're gonna have some issues here as it's trying to find it. Uh, now I'm curious, is this auto-locking? I don't really know how this... No, it's not auto-locking. Um, how do I turn on the locker on this one? I know some of you are like screaming at the camera right now going, hit this button, but I can't... I don't know where it is. Well, you know, maybe it doesn't have it. It just has an icon that shows it as having an unlock status and you can't actually lock it. I don't know. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the text down below here uh, so you can see what we ultimately found out after the fact. But I think the key thing here is if this thing actually does have a rear locker, it, this is ridiculous that I can't find the button for it. Okay, let's do this. So now we're gonna get out without using that. I'm gonna roll back just a little bit because I wanna get a little bit more to the left. Okay, so I'm gonna drive left. I wanna see my front view camera. I kinda of wish the front view camera would just pop up automatically. Come on, go, 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 forward facing camera. Okay, make sure I don't drive completely off the course, use a little momentum. So we're gonna prep now for the next part of the course. For the final climb, I'm gonna keep it in four low, but I'm gonna to switch to sand mud. I'd actually switch to rock briefly to get over that hump. <laughs> the wheel spin was actually causing a lot, too much slipping basically. So now I have the sway bar disconnected, I have sand mud mode, and I'm in four low. Interesting to note too that you can disconnect the sway bar even when it's under tension, which is good. Old systems that were automatic didn't allow you to do that. Uh, the Ford Bronco also lets you do that. So the approach here is really just to gun it, 
because uh, we need to use momentum while it really hustles for grip. Now, normally I have to take it really slow, but with all of the ground clearance that I have at my disposal, I'm just gonna use that. So here we go. And floor it up and over. Come on! Ah, yes! <laughs> Makes it easy. But we're not done yet. One final climb and then we'll wrap this up. I'm just gonna gun it because it's loose. And there we go! Ha! <laughs> no problem at all. And that's our look at the 2022 Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk. It is really an extraordinarily capable vehicle that is comfortable, has the latest tech, and it looks pretty good too. Is this really the family SUV that you need? Well, if you're gonna be going off-road at all, or you just you go into the snow a lot, you need advanced capabilities, this is really a great choice. You're not gonna find anything with this level of capability for less than probably $80,000 if you shop around. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthat. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, share our videos. We make them for you, and I hope you enjoy them.